So thank you very much for coming to um, this uh, meeting, which I stress is a, a very informal um, conversation. It's part of a suite of activities that um, the IMLR is engaged with, uh, in particular with the University Council of Modern Languages, which has been extremely active in thinking about how we can address questions of student mobility at a time which is constantly changing. This is not an easy time for modern languages or indeed the arts and the humanities. Um, changes are appearing very rapidly uh, and we need to respond to those. Part of what we're doing, of course, is thinking that the sector uh, is as joined up as it possibly can at all elements of uh, education uh, in modern languages understood as a capacious disciplinary field, which is uh, an important, very important uh, expert mode of addressing the way in which language and culture comes together. It's especially important for us to assume visibility within public discourse and to, shoot, and to make sure that our actions are as concerted as they possibly can. The question of mobility is vexed, of course, uh, with the uh, rather unanticipated withdrawal of the Erasmus programme and uh, the rather rapid creation of the Turing uh, scheme, which many of us have been involved in preparing our applications to, um, to the scheme. We need to be thinking, of course, in the short term, we'll be anticipating our, the responses to our applications to Turing, but we also need to be thinking much more in the medium term about ways and means of ensuring that mobility, linguistic and cultural, uh, which is what we do, remains as uh, central to our programmes as possible. And one of the means in which we can do that is to think about whether it, we can develop or establish um, a, uh, the model of the transnational campus. So what we've done is to invite a series of uh, um, very distinguished people, friends, who um, can talk uh, about their experiences of the transnational campus and to um, have a, an informal uh, open conversation about uh, the advantages and ways of operating of the transnational campus, which may well be um, something, as I say, that we have to consider um, uh, much more as we uh, think in the medium term. So I've asked uh, speakers to speak for, uh, for 10 to 15 minutes about their experiences, and then really open to, as I say, a very informal conversation uh, uh, in which we can explore uh, the possibilities uh, that this particular operation uh, allows. So just a word on our speakers. Jeremy Carette is going to speak first. He is Professor of Philosophy, Religion and Culture and Head of Religious Studies at the University of Kent, where he is Dean for Europe for the University. We're then going to ask Rita to speak um, from uh, Australia. Rita is Professor in Translation Studies at the School of Languages, Literatures, Cultures and Linguistics at Monash and Interim Director of the Monash Intercultural Lab. She is Deputy Dean and Associate Dean for Graduate Research at the Faculty of Arts. Um, my colleague, Tim Gore, uh, is going to speak uh, finally. He's responsible for the leadership of University of London Institute of Paris, ULIP, uh, a role to which he brings uh, 30 years experience of leadership of a great variety of teams and projects in cultural and linguistic settings in both Europe and in Asia. His main area of expertise is university strategy in an international context. So without more ado, uh, I will mute myself and pass the word to Jeremy. Okay, thank you, Charles, and thank you for that introduction. Good to be here with, with everybody, and uh, glad that we can continue conversations and engagements despite the challenges of our present uh, situation. So what I would like to do, and, and um, forgive me if I bring to my Dean role uh, a philosophical focus, 
But what I want to look at is the logic of the transnational campus. And in doing that, I want to try and find that the, that the underlying rationale for why we do what we do. And as Charles has indicated, what we're trying to kind of assess here is the, the, the advantages and the difficulties of a transnational campus. And I think that the, the basis of that is really asking the question of the underlying logic. So I've got here in this presentation really seven forms of logic that underlie the transnational campus. As you can see here, we have a, a commitment at the University of Kent to four locations, two of which are in continental Europe, which I am responsible for overviewing the management of. So I think the first element of thinking about the transnational campus is clearly about strategy and the logic of our strategy. And it's about vision and the coherence of any mission of a university. Now, the uniqueness, of course, of the University of Kent is that it's in the county of Kent. And as you can see here, these beautiful images of the White Cliffs of Dover, it's of, of the nearest, shortest distance uh, to continental Europe. 33.3 kilometers or 20.7 uh, miles is the shortest stretch. So you can see on a, uh, on a nice sunny day, you can see uh, the, the, the continent from the White Cliffs and that shapes something of place and identity of a university. That's not to say that universities like Warwick in the center of the UK, who obviously have a, a big European connection, haven't established a different um, outreach, but the logic is different. The logic is therefore a, a, about how they want to build their identity. But the key element for the University of Kent is that geography, region, place inform that logic and strategy. And that's important because the, the Transmanche, the English Channel, provides an interconnection, an interconnection both in terms of business and in terms of trade and transport. So we are at the gateway of Europe. We work with Kent County Council in our civic mission around the tourism and business. And the diagram at the bottom there, or the map, is in effect a one that was used by the Strait Committee and the 3i network, which are local regional engagements of West and East Flanders and Northern France and Kent, joining both universities, businesses and local councils to work together. So we have a, a, a definite logic that drives those regional partnerships. And of course, our, our brand, which came about <clears throat> because of our European centres, is obviously enhanced by the uh, locality as well. So the drivers of a transnational campus are evident in the strategy. The second logic is, of course, a place. And why do we go to any particular place? And what is the rationale and underlying driver there? And of course, here it is, it is about place and place making. And we build our courses, our programs around a location which is relevant to the subject. And as I will explain in a moment, obviously Brussels and Paris are where we put that focus and energy and they enable us to build programs around the city. So this, we try to listen to what the city represents, what it conveys. And within this, there's a fundamental, and again, forgive the philosopher in me, a link to knowledge as relationship. This obviously comes through the great um, forgotten Neo-Kantian philosopher Renouvier, who obviously influenced Durkheim and James, but also filters through in the French tradition to Foucault. But knowledge fundamentally is about that kind of interconnectedness. We learn from the connections, the different kinds of connections produce different kinds of knowledge. So in the notion of place, the place produces forms of knowledge. It generates forms of knowledge. And the logic of place there is about building that place, building the understanding of what messages we get from the place in a process of place making, which we've done in other locations, but which have had a coherence and a strength to the representations of Brussels and Paris to the international community. So from strategy and place, we build the framework for the kind of centres that we've established. And we have two centres, the Brussels School of International Studies. We've been there for 23 years. 
and we therefore focus around these issues of the place determining the program. And so we offer politics and international relations and international law. We have 17 staff, academic and administrative there, as well as using um, ex externals who are specialists in, in the institutions surrounding um, our, our location. We also therefore use the city to build connections to the European Commission, the European Parliament, NATO, and a wide variety of NGOs. And that's important because we're not just using the place to deliver academic programs, which we could do in our main campus, but it's making sure that we're integrating the whole experience. The other campus that we have, of course, is the Paris School of Arts and Culture. We've been there for 12 years, from 2009. And again, using that placemaking understanding and how the knowledge is the relation to the city. We have produced there a set of programs which are humanities based around film, around creative writing, around history of art and architecture. So the logic defines that the place and the city shaping how we're constructing our programs. Now that's all very well, I think, but then we come to a different logic and that's the logic of program sustainability. In a very challenging environment, we have uh, obviously new competitors. I've already made it clear in the last slide, I didn't highlight it in, in what I was saying is of course that we're delivering these programs at master's level, but also in English. And that has obviously changed, the landscape of delivery in English is changing. We have a much uh, sharper competitors in relationship to that, to that kind of offer. Our programs are constantly being evaluated in terms of their market value, in terms of how we want to renew the programs. And that's a fluctuating situation. And that's obviously one that's very challenging, but we are trying always to ensure a certain threshold of numbers on these programs and to see whether we're, the, the changing international environment, particularly for our Brussels program, that we're speaking to the social and political and legal issues that those programs represent. And, and they are obviously shaped by these uh, bigger changes in, in our world. For example, we've just introduced global health policy. So we're responding to the new conditions, the new demands that are, are, are out there with these new programs. Obviously in Paris, um, we've had to refine our program offer um, because of delivery costs, which obviously I'll come to a bit later in terms of the challenges that are underlying this. But we're trying to all here focus on ensuring that we have lecturers in situ delivering these courses. And our refined delivery now is around this creative writing, film and history and philosophy of art and we have a split site, that means they can have one semester in our main campus in Canterbury and then the spring semester in, in Paris. So I think this is one of the, the great difficulties is that you can't assume that the programmes that, that you're teaching now have the long-term sustainability and refining and understanding the changing market is key. Once all of those things are set up, I think we're facing the logic of place of and then the logic of space and premises and this is a, a, a difficult one in terms of what we actually require a building to do for us what what is the space doing and in many senses we we can't provide the main campus the, the, as everybody will know that the difficulty of the transnational campus is what you can provide in the, the the place and what you can't how you rely on the technological links to the main campuses what you want the space to do in terms of providing an auditorium where you can receive public events, which we have there in Brussels, you'll see from the little diagram, the kinds of space that we have. We have um, lecture rooms and a big auditorium for big events. And we have study spaces, we have academic offices, PhD rooms, but we obviously don't have a fully fledged library. We have a small uh, library in the study space, but we're interconnected always to the main campus to all of the resources that the main campus offers. Then we're integrated into the city to providing the wider social frameworks, the gyms, the kind of lifestyle, the, the cafeterias, the restaurants that the main campus would have. So I think there are certain challenges about the kinds of experiences. And the central challenge here about the logic of premises is to meet expectations, 
to make it clear to students and those coming about what we are offering and to manage their arrival in terms of the expectations. In Paris, we're obviously, we benefit from the beautiful architecture of Reed Hall, a Columbia University Global Centers, where we buy into a, a space. And here, we obviously, we're working with the subject area. So the kind of conditions of place enable that reflectiveness, beautiful gardens, as well as the cities and the cafes, which fit the subject area. And of course, there are different challenges here about negotiating space with uh, um, our landlord and how that works in terms of the legal issues is fundamentally different from the kinds of spaces that, that we have in Brussels. So there are all sorts of technical things that underlie this. The other form of logic is the value added logic. Not only do you deliver the core programs, but you have to then provide a sense that there is all the reasons for being in that city and providing programs, lecture series, which are relevant to the city, building the profile, having a very active graduate student union with all international events and activities is very important for the social life when you're a, a, a campus detached from the main um, center. And then, and then of course, as I've mentioned, placements and links to the city become key. And here you just get the sense that the city is the university. City as university is one of our key um, primary focuses. And we have this sl particular slide we send to uh, the beginning of our welcome week, which is a, a demonstrating that before COVID, you could get a free lunch in the European Commission almost every day of the week. And those engagements are, are fundamental and have been a great challenge for us during COVID times. And in Paris, we're integrating those value added elements by working with organizations like Columbia University Institute for Ideas and, Imagine, and Imagination by using their space for our own research institute links. The other logic uh, is of course partners. I don't think you can do any work in an international environment without recognizing you are a part of a community, uh, a wider community of universities. And of course, in Brussels, our, our vital founding partner was VUB. We have a very close relationship in terms of shared library uh, facilities and access. We share courses, they can take courses with us and we can take courses with them. I think that syn synergy is very important. And of course, our link to Columbia University in, in Paris, but also our other partners that uh, connect with us for programs like Paritois, of course, in Paris, but also the wider universities where we have very vital links in the country, particularly in Belgium, we're integrated into the whole network of, of universities. So I don't think there's a transnational campus for me without understanding the logic of partnerships, the logic of place, and delighted that uh, we've now had a new partnership with ULIP um, in the last year, building on our uh, shared British interests in, in Paris. And finally, there's the logic of connection. I think one of the greatest challenges, as everybody will appreciate, is that when you are at a, a, a transnational campus, you are a satellite campus, and there are all sorts of challenges with that. There are additional costs because of the infrastructure you have to kind of set up. There are cultural changes in terms of employment contracts, in, 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 in terms of the very linguistic structures that you're working with. There are issues around the different kinds of contracts, both in, in terms of the legal setup that you're going to um, find uh, ways to bring in new lecturers from um, both the local countries, but also internationally. And there are all sorts of challenges around that. We've uh, obviously now got new challenges with competing legal views on whether British academics can actually teach in continental Europe, the new regulations. And because of all of those additional elements, it requires an additional commitment. There has to be a belief in the strategy and the place and the purpose to overcome the time element that all of those things um, require. And the fundamental link of all of that, as we all know in any institution is communications. The very sense that you feel, you can easily feel cut off, um, but though then, You'll all know that colleagues in other parts of the university, everybody feels that they're not getting enough communication, that they were left out of certain decisions. But when you've got the action of, of geography determining communications, that's also a key issue. So just finally, um, a little thing that we tweeted out about travel, not to escape life, but to find it. Um, we are, of course, 
integrated all the time um, from the, the local, the, the European and the global operating in one space. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Jeremy. That was fascinating uh, perception of the way in which um, we can really think about the density of connections that this, this allows. Uh, but plenty of things that we can come back and discuss uh, from, from that um, extremely dense uh, uh, and uh, fascinating presentation. So in order for us to have time to discussion, I'm going to move uh, to our next uh, speaker and ask Rita to say uh, a little bit about the transnational campus. Thank you very much, Charles. And I'm very pleased to be able to be here to take part in this interesting transcontinental conversation um, in what is evening for me in Australia. And I want to thank Jeremy, um, especially because I'm really glad you started. All of your logics that you've outlined resonate with, I think, with what I'm about to say. But the one thing I need to um, stress from the beginning is that um, we're in a very different, different geopolitical situation um, and a geopolitical position. So um, I will say a few things about Monash as a university because I'm not sure how many people are familiar with the university. It is a relatively young university founded in 1958. It is the largest and the most global of the Australian universities. We have about 75,000 students across four Australian campuses and about 11,000 students enrolled at the um, offshore campuses. And this is not including the students that go out on um, exchange or on short-term mobility experiences. We have five transnational campuses, and I'll briefly mention each of the other four before I move on to the um, Prato campus, which is what I'm going to focus on today. The most um, established of the transnational campuses is the Malaysia campus uh, based in Kuala Lumpur, which offers undergraduate, postgraduate and PhD programs across six schools, each of which is affiliated with one of the 10 Monash faculties. So we are a large, comprehensive mass education university, and I think it's important to bear that in mind in terms of the way we operate in the mobility space. Um, the next, um, the other two that I wanted to highlight, with um, Southeast University, we have a joint graduate school in Suzhou, China, and that school offers only masters by coursework programs across a range of disciplines from engineering to humanities and social sciences, and we've, we've been offering for a few years now a very successful masters in interpreting and translation studies. In Mumbai, we have a, a research partnership with the Indian Institute for Technology in Bombay. It is only a joint PhD program, um, mostly offered by the faculties of engineering and science, but we do have a few humanities students enrolled in those degrees. And finally, this year, for the first time, we've opened a campus in Indonesia, in Jakarta. It will also be a postgraduate campus offering some select masters by coursework programs and um, a PhD program. And the importance of the Indonesia campus, uh, the opening of the Indonesia campus can't be um, underestimated because Australia and Indonesia have very strong political and economic relationships. And this is a way of trying to um, cement some of that relationship. So that logic of place is really important in what uh, Monash does. So why Monash Prato? Um, well, um, I'm also happy to share with you that it is the 20th anniversary of the Prato Center. It was this year. It was opened in 2001. And it was opened uh, very much with the idea that it would offer a Australian students a gateway to Europe. So yes, it is about the Prato Center and its connections with the community. Those are really important. Its connections to Italy. But more importantly, um, it's this notion of um, somehow combating the tyranny of distance and offering our students a base from which they can access um, European experiences. I do want to say a couple of things about the city. It is the second largest city in Tuscany. It is also Europe's largest textile district. 
And I think I can say with some confidence that it is the most multicultural city in Italy with a very large Chinese community that is now into its third generation and um, a huge number of other different nationalities that make up about 23% of the total population. I think that again, remembering um, Monash's geopolitical positioning, it's really important to think about how this particular transnational campus um, meets our um, overall strategy of internationalization and uh, transcultural education for our students. How does it work? Um, it is directly operated by Monash in leased premises. We are lucky enough to have leased um, a number of floors in a beautiful 18th century heritage listed building, the Palazzo Vai, right in the center of the, uh, right in the historic center of Prato. It is governed directly from Australia through the office of the Deputy Vice Chancellor Go Global Engagement. And we have a small but very dedicated team of uh, local professional staff at the center, including a full-time center manager. Um, its legal status currently in Italy is a not-for-profit foreign university. And what that means is that we can offer Monash programs, but that students can't enroll through Prato. It is not a degree granting entity at, um, at present. Um, I will spend a few minutes on the facilities because Jeremy made the comment about the importance of the campus for our students. And we've spent quite a lot of time thinking about this because the Prato Centre is very different from the Monash Australian campuses. It is a building, it's not a campus, but it has, um, we, in the last few years, we've spent quite a lot of time thinking about refurbishing it. It is very much now technologically as advanced as we can make it um, with a number of um, nano studios, a Mac lab for students and a state of the art computer lab, et cetera. A couple of, um, if you like, specialist facilities like a Renaissance uh, library and an archive of uh, films by independent filmmakers. The garden has relatively recently been restored and opened in 2016. Um, but having said that, that small center is buzzing with activity and it is very connected with the local life in Prato. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, with regard to funding, our funding model is very different from the UK and our students have access to um, university funds, not other funds. We don't have something like an Erasmus um, scheme, but we have generous funding through Monash abroad for every student at Monash. They can access once a year, the duration of their degree, some travel funds, which will cover basic travel and accommodation costs um, for an approved course that they take, either with our partner institutions or at one of our campuses. In addition, for Prato, there are some faculty-specific scholarships and some um, external scholarships. For example, we have one which is earmarked for students of Italian descent through the Italian Australian Foundation, and they fund a number of travel grants. The Bill Kent Foundation Fund, which is named after the founder of the Prato Center, um, is a philanthropic entity, and one of its priorities is to raise funds to increase the access for our students to study overseas, particularly those from underrepresented represented communities. So Monash uses the Prato Center really to connect into research networks across Europe and North America quite a lot. Um, and I can talk about that a little bit more later, but um, I do want to focus in on what our students do in Prato. I did mention that we have 10 faculties. Seven of the 10 faculties offer elective undergraduate uh, units at the Prato Center, with a few faculties offering semester length programs. The, the longest standing of these has been uh, the law faculty, which has been running a successful program for, since 2002. And in 2019, it opened the program to partner institutions. Our art, design, and architecture faculty offers a semester-length program also since 2004. 
Um, it's accompanied by a three-month visual residency program for Australian artists, and this runs alongside the faculty's teaching program and provides a really rich experience for the students and is very much part of the value add of that particular faculty's offerings. I should note that um, about 20% of Monash's total outbound student coursework mobility ends up in Prato. So it's a very well used center from the Australian end. Unfortunately, big, like many other places in 2020, we had to suspend all of the education programs because of the pandemic. Um, we haven't been able to offer any programs this year either, but we are planning a return to student international travel in 2022. And Prato is one of the centers that will be uh, reactivated as part of this. Um, Speaking of how we integrate our students and staff into activities in Prato, we have been offering for many years now a short crash course in Italian um, language and culture, Parliamo, which is offered free of charge to anyone staying in Prato for over three weeks. And it is taught by local staff, um, by local teaching staff. Um, I should also mention that we have run in the past, we've run very successful doctoral summer schools at Prato, and this will be a feature of what we're thinking about in terms of reactivating the campus in 2022. The Faculty of Arts has been operating through the Prato Centre since it was opened. Um, in addition to the various undergraduate elective uh, units that we've offered across the years, We've offered a, sem a semester length program across a range of the humanities and social science disciplines since 2017. These, um, this program is open to students from both Monash Australia and Monash Malaysia, and that's really enriched the intercultural experience for our students. In 2022, we're planning to offer a new interdisciplinary and industry driven semester length program through the arts faculty. The, curr the curriculum is actually being designed more or less as I speak, and it's designed to incorporate content from multiple faculties on topical themes, um, the so-called big challenges like human migration and identity, sustainable communities, Europe and the world, and of course, ine inevitably, how pandemics transform society, which is something which is very much on our minds at the moment. Um, our biggest and most, um, if you like, experimental um, and impactful uh, initiative has been the Global Immersion Guaranteed, a guarantee program. This was started by the arts faculty. It is a large, as in we send about 200 students a year through uh, on this program, it's guaranteed funded overseas experience for every first year student in the arts faculty. And that's every first year student in the arts faculty in the BA or any of our specialist degrees or any of the associated double degree students. Um, it has been truly transformative for some of these students. Some students who went on it in 2019 had never been overseas before. And they it, it was really quite moving to hear their reflections on what this meant to them. In 2019, we were fortunate that all of our students were able to go to one of the five transnational campuses. Unfortunately, again, in 2020 and 2021, we weren't able to offer the program, but we are planning to reactivate it in 2022. Now, the thing about this program is that it is deliberately interdisciplinary and we work with a range of partners that are not university partners. So either industry partners, local community um, organizations or NGOs. And they all of the topics that the students deal with are at the intersection between environment, society and technology. And they work with local people to think about innovative and sustainable solutions for that particular locality. Because, we're into, because of the difficulties that we've um, experienced through the pandemic, we've had to limit seriously what we're thinking about for 2022. And we've identified two international locations. Italy will be one of them and a range of um, destinations in the Pacific Islands will be others. And this is really to do with um, 
our ability from Australia to manage things like visa requirements and quarantine um, regulations and so on and so forth. And we're trying to anticipate uh, disruptions that might continue to be caused by the ongoing impact of the pandemic. So we're trying to think about um, what we can offer that won't disrupt the students' uh, study plan too much. And this is where Prato, having the center in Prato has been really useful because we are very familiar with the regulations that are being put in place in Italy. We've been doing this for 20 years in that space and we think we can manage it much more um, carefully. So uh, as we found it in 2020. Climate change, tourism and food security. And I can talk more about those various field sites and what they might be doing there if there's interest in the Q&A session. Um, okay. I um, thinking about the logic of place and the logic of what we want our students to experience. I think for us, the being able to provide our students with genuine intercultural experiences as part of their mobility program is absolutely fundamental. And the way we've done it in Prato is to have very careful, curated, and ongoing local engagement, ranging from informal conversation exchanges for our students to a lovely program um, with families who have volunteered to run a Buon Appetito program, offering home cooked meals to our students. The students cook with the locals and then eat with them. We've, we've had some financial contribution from local government. Of course, we do all the regular public events and film screenings and so on. Uh, we've negotiated a Monash Prato card that offers our students and visitors discounts at certain businesses. And there is a long established and truly successful homestay program that provides the students with a really rich intercultural experience. In the last three or four years, we've focused very much on providing internships and workplace um, learning for our students. And we now have a range of workplaces um, with which we have agreements in Prato, Florence and Rome. And we, we're trying to expand that as well. Another aspect of the intercultural experience is our engagement with schools. Um, from the Australian side, we have a range of Australian secondary schools that go annually on tours to Prato to study subjects like Italian or art history or music. And on the left of my slide, you'll see a group of students who produced these t-shirts with a workshop that they did um, from with the textile museum. They're from an Australian secondary school in Melbourne. And the right hand side of my slide, you'll see an image from a very recent um, project that we ran with local Prato uh, high schools. In 2019, um, we were fortunate to use one of our research projects um, around migration and social inclusion to run a participatory action workshop a series of participatory action workshops with local um, Prato high schools. We worked with 48 students from very different cultural backgrounds and ethnic backgrounds uh, from eight local schools to produce an interactive digital map of the city. And the map reflects their stories and experiences of this city and most importantly, how they envisage the future of the city. I really encourage you to look at this website. It was quite inspiring working with the students and I think they've produced a stellar um, output. I'll just finish um, on our, uh, with just highlighting some of our current strategic priorities for the university. Um, most importantly, we're in the process of establishing a Monash European Research Institute at the Prato Center. And this is to enable us to have greater access to European research networks, including access to European Union funding. At the moment, the Prato Center is not um, legally able to receive European funding for research. And because all of the teaching that we do at Prato in some way resonates 
with um, the various faculties' research priorities, it's really important for us to have that structured approach to um, trying to support it through other um, funding networks. It's also a way of us thinking about diversifying our student recruitment and trying to attract more, if you like, European students to our various programs, particularly to our PhD program. Um, in addition to the undergraduate uh, units that I've talked about, we're seriously thinking about developing more intensive master's coursework offerings. And the way we do this is through a series of partnerships with our current university partners. Um, I do take Jeremy's point, you can't do any of this without some really good, solid partnerships on, in a range of ways. Um, and again, this is why we're also focusing on trying to develop more government and industry relationships with Italy and more broadly in Europe to build um, education and research opportunities, ones that will also be able to engage our Monash alumni, alumni who are quite widespread across the world. Having said that, I do want to stress that what's really important for us in all of these activities is the desire to increase student access um, to be as inclusive as we can in offering these mobility opportunities to our students, and particularly to focus in on embedding in our pedagogies an approach to teaching that takes intercultural competence as, as its core, if you like. Um, we really are trying to avoid in all of this that kind of commodified approach to learning abroad, which turns it a bit into a kind of, uh, to be crude, turns it into a kind of tourism learning abroad experience. So we've been quite um, focused and quite uh, intentional in the way that we set up the reflective assessments for our students and so on and so forth. So I think I'll just stop there, Charles. I'm very happy to take questions or comments. Thank you, Rita. That was great. It gives us a real vision of what a university can do uh, as a complete experience and the way in which um, this kind of initiative um, can actually drive a, a university uh, mission, uh, following on from the logics um, that Jeremy was talking about um, to begin with. I'd like finally to invite our last speaker, um, Tim, to talk about ULIP. I've been careful to unmute my microphone, which is the usual first mistake. Uh, good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Really, really pleased to be here. And thank you, Charles, for inviting me to talk about the transnational campus. Sh shall I put on my slide? Um, share screen. There we go. Excellent. So. Again, thank you to Charles for the invitation and lovely to be to be joining the panel with with uh, Rita and Jeremy. Uh, Jeremy and I have have regular catch ups on some of the issues that uh, he's been talking about today. And I really appreciate the, the framework of the seven logics that uh, you you introduced to us today. I think that's that's really, really pertinent. And uh, I'm also pleased to find out from Rita that I share a birthday with Manash, so we're of equivalent age. That's nice to know. <laughs> um, I don't share a birthday with, with ULIP, with the University of London Institute in Paris, because it was actually created at the end of the 19th century. So it has quite a bit of longevity. And that's a factor that I'll refer to right through, because I think it's really, really relevant for the pertinence and the, the strategy that we've followed. For, for the branch campus. Um, but to take a step backwards, we're part of the University of London, which I'm sure um, many of you know is, is a federal university based in London with 17 autonomous universities making up the membership of the Federation. And um, the Institute in Paris, like uh, the IMLR, is, is a part of the centre uh, of the University of London. And really, the University of London is all about partnership. We, we, we work with the member institutions in a, in a very network focused way because there's no compulsion to work as, as a federation where all of the universities are, are autonomous in their own right. Uh, but we work particularly closely, obviously with, with uh, Charles and, 
and the institutes uh, in London, but also with Queen Mary University of London, with King's College London and with Goldsmiths University particularly closely. Uh, but we have a number of relationships with UCL and with many of the other um, member institutes of, of the Federal University. <coughs> the um, ULIP was set up, as I, as I said, at the time as a philanthropic institution, and it, its basic strategy and rationale hasn't changed. It, it's essentially about the interface between the Francophone and the Anglophone world, about Paris, London as twin cities, and about, I suppose, the, the philosophical and epistemological uh, issues that uh, Jeremy referred to, that um, existing on this sort of boundary between a different uh, political system, a different uh, linguistic and cultural tradition, and a different philosophical and educational system really acts as a catalyst and it informs everything we do. So transnationalism is, is really um, completely pervasive through our small academic community in Paris. At the moment, um, we occupy two buildings right in the center of Paris, just, be, just next to the uh, Assemblée Nationale, so really in the center of Paris. We share those buildings with the British Council and have coexisted with the British Council uh, for, for a good number of years now. And um, we, uh, like, like uh, Rita said, it's not really a campus, it's more of a building, but we see Paris as our campus as you can see from uh, the students enjoying the Esplanade just outside our, our front door here. And I think it's really, really important for us to, to make sure that we're really embedded into the city in a really meaningful way. And uh, what I'd like to do in over the next few minutes is talk to a, a few of the headings that Charles said would be, would be of interest, which is, you know, what are the advantages of having this sort of transnational campus? Uh, what's the student experience like? Uh, how do the staff manage? What are some of the difficulties? And, and coming back to language, as language and culture is one of the central um, dimensions of our relationship, I, I suppose. So I think um, starting off again on longevity, the, the relevance pertinence of the Institute changes, obviously, uh, over time. And um, program sustainability as, as Jeremy mentioned, it's also something that we have to be constantly flexible, adaptive to the circumstances. And just to give a very simple example of how that works, in, in the 20s, 30s, 40s, not many British universities had international offices. So we were actually um, a consortium of British universities, including London, supporting the centre in Paris, and a consortium of French universities supporting it as well. So we had a joint board. Uh, we were based in the Université de Paris at the time. And it, it was a collaborative endeavor aimed at mobility, aimed at li linguistic uh, competence going both ways and intercultural capabilities going both ways. Uh, clearly most universities these days have their own international offices. So we don't work in the same way. We're not a consortium in the way that we are that we used to be, but we are uh, deeply embedded in a number of partnerships that take advantage of our physical location in Paris. Um, so I think the, the location here is, is obviously a clear advantage for our students. Our students, our undergraduate students, most of them spend three years with us. Some of them come on short mobility projects, but the vast major, majority have, have three years of their life in a foreign city. A lot of them are British, many European, international, American, quite a, quite a variety of different types of students. Uh, and we run at the undergraduate level, we run a, a French studies programme, which is really a sort of liberal arts programme, but taught primarily in French, which is, is of great interest to students who have a, a proficiency in French and want to deepen that, but also widen out their intercultural and uh, their sort of humanities and social sciences education generally. And we also run uh, in parallel with that an international politics program, which is about global politics, obviously with a, a focus on the Francophone world and its intersection with the Anglophone world, but, but thinking about global issues and that, that program is taught in English. However, we do, tr we do make sure that there are lots of stepping stones between the two programs so that the students uh, engage with each other and, and um, 
gain value from the, the experiences that the different types of, uh, uh, of program can offer. And I think this comes back to the language advantage. Obviously, uh, students who come and study French studies with us have a good level of French when they come. And that was something that is a historic strength that we, we allow students to come to the natural place to, to use and develop their French, which is you know, the capital of, of France and the Francophone world in many ways. Um, so that, that's an obvious advantage. But we're, we're now getting a lot of students who come to us with either no French or, or very little French. But one of the first things they do before they leave the UK is they put their phones, their mobile phone settings on French and immediately they start to immerse themselves in, in the language and the culture that they're going to be living in. So it's, that's a real, real advantage for them, which, which naturally brings me to the student experience because these students are clearly living in Paris and usually working in Paris. Most of our students work, many of them look after uh, local school kids, uh, pick them up from school, provide a little bit of English tuition on the, um, but, uh, but develop a relationship with, with the local family, which really stands them in good stead as they go forward. Many of them also work in different types uh, of roles in Paris, but there's always um, plenty of opportunities for bilingual uh, young, young people to, to work and uh, get involved in the professional life in Paris. So I think that's, again, a, a great advantage from the student experience point of view. In terms of, of us as a campus, we're, we're quite a small community. We, we have about 200 of our own students and about 60 Queen Mary students on the campus uh, and maybe about uh, 18 staff. Um, so, of course, there is a tendency and um, a proclivity perhaps for the community to become introverted and students to come here from wherever their home is and then immerse themselves in the local, in the academic community, but not get out into Paris. So one of our constant, um, constant, uh, we're constantly striving, if you like, to try and make sure that, that students really gain the best they can from, from life in Paris and life in France and life in, in a global city that Paris is. So we're, we're Recently, we, we engaged with a number of French universities on, a, on a, an experiment in e-mobility, which was a, a winter school focused on, on uh, the climate conference coming up in Glasgow this year, thinking about how to make it more diverse and more accessible for, for young people. Uh, but doing that through an online um, immersion program that was specifically aimed at increasing intercultural, linguistic and uh, um, transnational capabilities among the students. So it was a really interesting experiment in doing that through, through the screens. But having said that, our, our students throughout the pandemic have continued to come to Paris from wherever they're coming from, from, from the States, from Britain, from other European countries, from um, some African countries. They, they've managed to get here, managed to live here. And, and that's been part of their growth, I think, part of their experience. It's been a very tough, um, period for students, but again, something I think that they've uh, grown considerably through this experience in coping with a world as a stressed and sometimes traumatic world. In terms of the staff and the teaching, what is it like for staff? Well, we have to, we have two different models. Um, the, the University of London programs that we run here, the undergraduate and our single postgraduate program, are all taught by staff that live and work in Paris. There are staff that are bi bicultural, bilinguist, bilingual, and um, in really invested in their life in, in Paris, in France at the time. Most, um, many of them British, some of them French, some of them other nationalities, uh, but all of them provide uh, a really sort of uh, interesting cultural experience, I think, that it's in a sense a gateway, a bridge between um, uh, between the UK higher education system and the French higher education system. So that's very comforting for many of our students and particularly mobility students who would feel very threatened by being asked to uh, immerse themselves in a 100% in a French environment. They know that they can be supported in this bilingual way, have every opportunity 
uh, to develop their language and cultural skills, but at the same time uh, have a, quite a high degree of pastoral support. So, so that's good, I think. The, the, the downside, I think, for the academic community is it's quite a small academic community. We're nominally part of the UK higher education system. So um, at a distance, that can be a little bit alienating. And it's very easy for a small academic community to be cut off. And I think um, that comes back to one of the, the logics of connection that Jeremy again referred to, of the centre and the outreach, if you like. We're the, we're the only permanent campus of the central part of the University of London. <coughs> so there are adapt uh, uh, excuse me. There are adaptations to be constantly made between the centre and and the branch, and I think that's that's an ongoing uh, relationship that we're constantly working on. Uh, difficulties again, um, program sustainability. Programs come and go, and um, it is quite difficult being able to keep up with the pace of change that the market demands. Uh, we're Clearly, we're in the process of developing a whole new suite of undergraduate programs and, and um, evolving our postgraduate provision uh, because the market has, as, as uh, both Jeremy and Rita have mentioned, has, the market has changed and we have to keep up with that. Um, for, for an institute that has only two core undergraduate programs and one core postgraduate program to be renewing and, and changing those is a challenge for us. We have limited resources to be able to do that. But again, that's something that I think over, over the whole history of the, the Institute in here in Paris, it's something that's uh, constantly been a factor of our lives, having to uh, ensure that the programs keep up with the, with the demands of students and that we keep sustainability of programs and sustainability of the Institute in mind at all times. And coming finally to the, the language issues, obviously we're, we're based in France, so the primary language that we're interested in and engaged in is French. We, many of our students came to us in the past with a, already a very good competence in French and we help them perfect that. And obviously being based in Paris is, is an excellent environment for that, but that, that's changing. The nature of modern languages is changing. Um, I, I believe also that the intrinsic motiva motivation to study a language is, is uh, massively um, impacted by technology because it's so easy to turn on subtitles on your Netflix. It's so easy to, to, do, to use Google Translate. It's so easy to, to access la languages in a way that we never could before. Uh, in an easy way. So what's the advantage of learning a language and becoming really profoundly engaged in that language? I, I think that only comes, uh, in my opinion, when you start to become really fluent in that language. And as the, as the barriers to access are, are sort of going up in a way, both through sort of structural issues in the UK, both at school and university level, uh, and also the motivations are changing, it's, it's quite difficult to keep up with that. Um, so we're finding we're getting a lot more ab initio students who come and study, for example, politics or cultural studies with us. But we do find that they are motivated to get engaged in the language. And one of our challenges is to make sure that we are, we are building on that motivation and providing the means to be able to reach out and get engaged in, in the language and the cultural experience. Also, many of our, our, our students are not engaged only in one language. If they're engaged in French, they're very often engaged in Spanish or in Arabic or German or another language as well. And um, at the moment, we, we don't provide any in-depth uh, other languages. We'd like very much to. We, we provide a little bit of support in Spanish. But what we're really trying to evolve to is to um, a campus and an academic community that encourages plurilingualism. It encourages students to have a go however good they are in any language and to to really build the motivations to get involved in all sorts of linguistic activity whether it be French as a primary uh, language or whether it be Spanish whether it be Arabic which clearly is is a very important language in France as well so I think that's that's an ongoing um, 
goal for us to be able to to play that part and i'm sure i'm sure charles will have something to say on 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 those issues as well but i think probably i'll, I'll wrap up there and we'll uh, leave space for any questions or comments thank, thank you <clears throat> thank you tim that was another terrific presentation um, talking about motivation change, the transnational campus, the way it changes the way in which we think about university, uh, what it does in terms of, of its role, its mission and its student experience. And all of what you say, of course, is deeply relevant to the identity and mission uh, and societal status of modern languages. Mm. So I think that I have at least a page and a half of questions, but I'm what I think we'll do is possibly if we what we might do harvest a few questions or uh, comments um, um, and then pose them to the speakers and then possibly uh, do it that way rather than um, uh, re responding one to one so to speak so do please um, let me know if you'd like to ask a question Keeping an eye on the chat. Jonathan Long. Hi, thanks, Joel. Shall I just, just see who I am? Um, yes, do, do. But thanks, uh, um, uh, Jeremy, Tim and Rita. That was really fascinating. Um, I'm Jonathan Long. I'm the head of, of Modern Languages and Cultures at Durham University. And I had a couple of questions for, for Rita. Um, the one is, I wonder if you could um, just sort of expand a little bit on on how how the um how the guaranteed global immersion program is funded um, because i'm sure it doesn't come cheap so th that would be really interesting to know and also if you were able to share any details about the the ways in which you assess intercultural competence that kind of go beyond the touristic and develop something more academically uh respectable as it were would, would be really useful as well so, Thank you. Thank you. So if you think a little bit about that, I'm just looking at the chat uh, at the moment. Uh, there's a chat about, uh, sorry, in the chat, there's a comment about uh, from Aparita. Um, Since physical mobility has been cancelled, how, yes, can you say a little bit more about how one deals with the new situations that that has created, some of which have been uh, very rapid and dramatic? Um, a comment from Anya. How difficult is it to convince senior management of the value of all of this? I mean, it does. One thing that emerges very strongly from your talks is if you've got your senior management behind you, you can do an enormous amount. But if you but that is not always an easy thing to do, as many of us know um, very, very well. Um, well, let's just take those those three questions and please do put more uh, questions in the chat or raise your hands, but we'll deal with those for, for the moment. Then I'll get to uh, Claire's um, comment. Um, so we'll have another round of questions, if that makes sense. So Rita, uh, do you want to start since uh, Jonathan? Sure. Um, yeah. Um, so, yeah, no, it's not cheap. Um, and uh, the gig. Um, our dean um, decided to work out how much the faculty could not could afford not to send students abroad. If you see what I mean, so we we it is very much part of the strategic mission of the faculty. Uh, our we get funding from the Australian federal government on how many students. It, it's like your I think you call it a wider. Mm, you have an expansion program in the UK, which is to, to provide access to students from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. I can't remember what it's called. Um, so we have a widening similar- Widening participation. That's the one, widening participation. It's the same, it's the same approach. And there is a, a, a pot of funding um, given to universities by the federal government to do this. It, it, at our university, we were asked to think about ways in which we could add value to students from that group and how we could include them in all of our normal activities. So we put, we took some of that funding and we added Faculty of Arts, if you like, strategic initiative funding for that first group of students uh, to enable them to go. 
what then happened is that we set up a series of partnerships for each of the sites where the students were going to visit. So for example, in India, we set up a partnership with the Tata Institute for Social Sciences. And essentially the TIS delivered the program for us. So we paid for the students to travel, we paid for the students accommodation, and we more or less set up an exchange with TIS where they delivered the program in situ for us, and we then deliver something else for them. So that was a, a, a particular partnership. In Prato, because um, as Tim was saying, we also have local staff that teach. We essentially manage the Italy component of that by funding the students from Australia for travel and accommodation, but then working with local entities where they contributed some funding to the student experience. So it's a, it's a co-funded model is the best way I can describe it. Um, with regard to the um, intercultural competence, we have been trialing with some success the use of the CQ test. I don't know how familiar everyone is with the CQ Center. It's an American-based center, and CQ stands for cultural intelligence. Uh, they, it's, it's a product that they license. We do a pre-departure CQ test with the students where they self-assess their cultural competence and their cultural awareness. Then we give them a series of um, scaffolded activities to do while they're away and when they come back um, in terms of self-reflections and a number of, of um, assessment tasks. And then when they come back, we give them um, a, a return test and then they get a report to, to see how their cultural intelligence, if you like, has developed through this particular experience. Now, we like this, not everybody likes this particular mode of testing, but it's worked very well for us. And what, what's good about it is that it's relatively cheap. It's quick for the students. It's not an um, onerous for them to do before they leave and they can get a group report. So as a group, they get to share with each other what they've learned. So that's worked really well for us. And we've, we've managed to incorporate that into all of our master's offerings and it's um, an elective component for our undergraduate students. I can send the link um, to Charles, if you like, uh, for the CQ. If, if anybody's interested, I could send the link. That would be great. I mean, we'll, we'll be posting um, details about the recording of that and we can uh, add further information. Absolutely. Um, thank you. Uh, Rita. Jeremy, would you like to comment? It's worth thinking about the kind of students that you get in the community coming to the wider cultural question. Well, we have about 40% of students who come from North America, 40% um, from the rest of the world, and, and then about 20% only from Europe. So I think the kinds of community that, that, that you're developing in terms of that um, a cultural awareness is actually the, the bringing of those different cultures together in, in, in the place. Um, that was just to kind of add on to, to, to the previous discussion. But in, in, in terms of the questions that were being posed, the, the, the response to COVID, I think, is um, probably been one of the hardest challenges that, that we've all faced and that has led us to some deep searching. And, and, and the said, it's been great to partner with ULIP in looking at those sort of shared I I issues because we have constantly had to address them as they were coming along. And there are multiple points of pressure in relationship to this, both in terms of how the main campus is responding in a different country, setting up different regulations, and then working with your own regulations in two different countries, which are all moving at different kinds of speed. So you've got three regulative structures which you're having to respond to, and then you've got multiple pressures of in an international group of students, some of who can get into the country, some of who can't travel, um, there are pr problems of managing quarantine structures, dealing with people who are reacting uh, to the changing stresses in their everyday lives. The mental health challenges have been very profound in all sorts of different ways on, on students. So the level of engagement and, and planning and organisation around the, the, the COVID response has, has been, an, been absolutely enormous. And you're literally at, at times dealing with managing people's understanding of their life death expectation. And I think that's profoundly difficult um, for people. Um, and I think we're still working through and understanding that. Um, so yes, a, a, a lot of additional work. Um, 
and of course very different kinds of response in the different um, countries according to the levels of, of um, cases um, but we've managed this through face-to-face -face where we've been able to and of, of course the the hybrid online structures that everybody is now very familiar with um, I, I think that the the biggest loss of course when you're building a program around place is that the challenge of the students and the sense of what they lose through that is, is, is of course very difficult. Um, quickly on senior managers, um, the, the point about senior managers is that they do change and I think that the, the point of that is that you've got to take each new um, group with you um, but of course as, as, as has been indicated by Tim and Rita, I mean it's, it's all about keeping everything relevant um, and the the way that you keep it relevant and the way you introduce new ideas within the changes, because all of these things are changing environments, very volatile changing environments, um, according to an international picture. But I think the, the key with all senior management discussions is that your bottom line um, <laughs> meets itself and you can't deliver something which is not um, financially viable. And, and therefore, the key thing is to start small to build up the program so it's financially viable and also contract if it's not, if it needs to, but where you still have the belief of the overall strategy and mission of the purpose of those locations, there's always a way because you just need to find the, the, the point by which it makes sense and how it can work with, with the market and the kinds of programs. So the ability to be adaptable to the changing environments um, and taking the senior management's through the belief of that adaptability and change um, within uh, different circumstances is obviously key. Thank you, Jeremy. I'd like to invite Tim to say a few words, especially about since the, the University of Mission is, is so key to, to uh, all three um, presentations. Thanks, Charles. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with what uh, Richard and Jeremy have said. Um, to my, to my mind, um, I mean, clearly universities are organizations um, and they're, but they're very particular types of organizations. They have great longevity, they have great relevance to society, but the, the relevance is not always immediately obvious uh, in, in everyday life. And the, the, the longevity is, is also related to timescales of development. Uh, to my, my particular sort of theoretical background is, is about dyna dynamic capabilities and, and how they play out in organizations. And I, I believe that organizations uh, encapsulate mainly through their staff, but partly through their history, um, the ability to do things, so different competencies, different capabilities that they have. Universities that consciously invest in transnational campuses develop very specific types of capabilities. They deal, as uh, both Rita and Jeremy have said, and Jeremy in particular talked about many of the, the political administrative uh, sort of transnational issues that you have to deal with, uh, legal issues that you have to deal with as a campus. Universities gain comp competence and capabilities by having to deal with these things and, and therefore become more globalized and more international themselves and more able to interact on the global scene. So I think that's the core argument for senior management. But as, as has been noted, senior man management changes, sometimes changes fairly frequently. So you, you have to renew the message. And you also have to be quite resilient in the sense that um, you can't make assumptions that an incoming uh, management group will have the same uh, history, the same views, the same understanding as an outgoing one. So you have to keep making the case. And sometimes that's, there's a repetitive issue to that. Um, but also there's another difficulty in the sense of timescale, because uh, as, a, as I mentioned, universities uh, work on a slightly slower timescale for, for good reasons, I think, but they work on a, a slower timescale than commercial organizations. Um, if I give the example of uh, the, the international politics program that we, we are now entering our third year in Paris, this was conceived of over, uh, about six years ago. It's taken us six years to get an undergraduate program up and running and to its sort of steady state process. 
uh, that's that means that we've traversed three senior management teams in in the process of doing that to keep the the uh, motivation the relevance the enthusiasm while things develop in such a slow way is very very difficult and there is a contradiction there so it's it's a contradiction that needs to be clearly discussed and 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 made a fairly transparent and uh, i completely agree with what jeremy said about needing to be adaptable but being adaptable in the sort in in a, in the context where it takes you six or seven years to get a program up and running fully um it's, it's difficult there is a contradiction there and and that's something that i think campuses are, are dealing with on, on a on a daily basis and uh, and going back to the to the to the value that a transnational campus delivers to uh, its home cam its home university in terms of capability, in terms of access to Europe, in terms of access to uh, knowledge, in terms of access to partnerships, uh, I think those things are quite difficult to quantify. So there are a number of contradictions in, in trying to justify your bottom line, if you like. Um, and all of that plays into the story that, that clearly we're having to discuss with senior management uh, on an ongoing basis. And it is essential that um, for the for the health and future and sustainability of a campus, that the, the university that sponsors it is totally on board and integrates all of the thinking about the future of the campus into the thinking of the, the strategy itself. So I think there are, there are many issues there. Um, just to say a little bit about the, the mobility issue, um, Mobility is a really, really interesting question at the moment, I think. I, I think all, I'm talking to a lot of North American universities about where they are in mobility. And uh, at the moment, most North American universities looking the year ahead are getting something like 75% reduction in applications, internal applications from students who want to travel. Uh, many international offices have been scaled down in, particularly in the US, but uh, across the world as well. Um, and coupled with that, a lot of us, both on the academic and the student side, are, are thinking about um, carbon footprints, so thinking about environmental in impact and thinking about how we deal with that. So where is mobility going? Uh, I mean, it's for that reason that I, uh, we, we've been experimenting with, with um, a more flexible uh, approach to mobility. Uh, luckily in Europe we're quite quite well endowed with trains and I think we should be encouraging trains, we should be encouraging students to to be mobile but by train rather than by air but of course we're lucky because we're, we're, we're connected by train. Um, that's not always possible so you know these these questions will feed into the future of mobility as we emerge from from the worst ravages of the pandemic and, and move forward. But I think it's questions we're all going to have to confront. Absolutely. Thank you. I'm going to take another round of questions um, to begin with Claire's question. Um, and that is, well, talking about how you can get sustained investment in particular transnational projects. And that's something that was present in all three of your talks. There's a question um, from Marcella uh, about the transnational and the global. There can be a concern that English can be default, become a lingua franca. How does one deal with that um, uh, is, is, is an essential question. And I think that's picked up very much by Michael also in the, in the chat, um, talking about the, uh, the emphasis on your talks on the plurilingual experience and the global experience, which is part of uh, all um, three of the examples that you gave. There's a question from Penelope about the American Q, uh, CQ test. Does that re refer to a specific culture? Um, and yes, uh, Parajita, um, just looking at that, um, yeah, I wonder, Aparajita, can you ask the question yourself? It might be easier for me to... Yes, um, yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rita, Jeremy and Tom, for oh, Tim, sorry for your wonderful presentation. It was very interesting and very interesting to get this macro kind of view over the whole um, mechanics of this. So I, I was just making a comment 
regarding something that we put in place in SALIS, that is School of Applied Language and Intercultural Studies in DCU. And that kind of echoes what Tim spoke about, um, the online interactions that you do in order to not just help students build their confidence before the actual immersion in, uh, in a partner institution, but also in the present context with the pandemic and, and with the cancellation of mobility. So what we did was we integrated telecollaboration in our curriculum. And so basically our students interacted with students, peers, native speaker peers from partner universities. And they um, basically um, created digital artifacts, be it videos, podcasts, etc together and in a bilingual setting. So it was all done online. And in, in French, we built part, online telecollaborative partnerships with universities in France and Brussels for that. So we got a huge, you know, we, we got very huge positive feedback from students um, with regard to that, especially in the, in the current context. So that was just a, a comment that I wanted to add. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. I'm going to invite the speakers. We'll go slightly over time. Um, but, but, but only slightly. So I'd, I'd like to invite our speakers to respond to those array of, of comments and, and questions. We'll, we'll start with Rita. Um. Thanks, Charles. So just quickly on the uh, CQ quest, uh, question. No, culture isn't a specific culture. They talk about cultural awareness. And what they're trying to do is, is build cultural awareness and working through international cultures. So the idea is that you're developing an intercultural competence through being aware of your own cultural intelligence. And, and that's the sense of that. Um, but I did want to make a couple of comments about language and the, what we're, we're currently calling at Monash virtual mobility, because we're also very conscious of this limited physical um, uh, you know, scenario that's opening up in front of us. Um, so what, we, what we're doing up, uh, is something very similar to what you've just said about Jurita. We, we're um, trying to, to embed in existing units that we're offering some kind of language and cultural exchange element. So we've done that for Indonesian and Japanese units already, and we're looking at the European languages. So even if it's just a small component, it's not necessarily going to be for those students going on exchange it's for all of our students, so that they're at least getting some of this experience, even though they're not traveling anywhere. And, and again, it's because we are really seriously trying to encourage the plurilingual, transnational, transcultural approach. And people have added words like decolonization and, and you know, aspects in the modern languages curriculum, but more broadly in the humanities curriculum. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention is the, the Prato project I talked about that we did with the high school students, they all spoke a bunch of different languages from their own backgrounds. And we encouraged them to use and to share their language and cultural experience with their peers. So they all spoke Italian as a lingua franca, but we encouraged the use and, the, and that sort of um, uh, translanguaging, if you like, activity. That's something we're trying to do a bit more in the academic programs, it's harder in the academic programs because of um, we're still, and, and I was interested in Tim's repeated reference to proficiency in language. It's something we're debating quite strongly. What do we mean by proficient language users? And to what extent are we, are we still stuck in that, in that kind of national model that we have for modern languages? So these are interesting questions which I think the mobility um, debates help us to unpack. Um, I, I'm, I'm rambling, so I'll just stop. <laughs> Thank you, Rita. Uh, Jeremy. Yeah, I think this is a very profound set of questions around language, because I think it actually relates to much wider things, which Tim was touching upon in terms of accessibility and the kind of cultural changes um, and I think it's a broader political economic question around language use. And I think we have to look at that in terms of dominant powers and also dominant institutions like the United Nations and the use of language, but also the use of language within the European Union, the European Commission. And a lot of people um, are in, in, in a sense confined by these kind of dominant powers. But I think that what we do provide, although we deliver in English, and that is um, a central part of how we market these courses, 
they are all provided with uh, linguistic support and language programs, both before they come, if they're based in the main campus beforehand, but also in, in situ as well. One of the interesting things, of course, is that take up for these is quite low compared with the, the other options, um, which are kind of, they're, they're not um, enforced options, of course. Um, so I think that that speaks to the wider cultural problem um, that we have within the linguistic sort of um, context. But I think another important issue, which is the point that I was trying to kind of add on to, to Rita's discussion about this um, cultural awareness, is that the students that we are coming from around the world, they bring a, a variety of different languages. So it's not just the in-country question and which they need in terms of their everyday life and which we provide. And there is an immersion element obviously to that, but it's actually how you create a pluralist community with diverse sets of languages, diverse sets of cultural experiences within um, the community that you're, you're building. And I think that is a question of how we build the whole equality, diversity and inclusivity um, program okay, and, and make sure that that's in the blood and the spirit of the kinds of places that we're building, which obviously connects with language because I think that exclusivity and language are related to it, but our programs for uh, um, equality, inclusivity and, and diversity must be broader than, than that and also raise a whole set of those political questions about why people are excluded and how language plays an important part but, but these are part of the critical skills that you get if you're doing law or international politics or um, creative writing or whichever location so I think it's a wider um, set of issues um, but I think also market from our point of view drives the, the reason for why people want to come and study with us and and, and that's probably an appeal to the question of the international languages um, that, that are available for both in terms of North American but also in terms of these wider pressures. Thank you Jeremy. <clears throat> I'd like to ask uh, Tim finally. Yeah thank you very much Charles. Yeah I was glad that uh, Rita brought in the question of decolonization as well because this is something that is of great concern to our students at the moment and our academic uh, community as well. So it's, it's, we, we have an ongoing uh, set of discussions with students, student staff um, discussions on such issues. And it's, it's been something that's, that's motivated um, the, the sort of staff student interface to, to be much, much more productive and much, much closer through, through discussions of some of these issues. But of course, um, the whole existence of a transnational campus is part of that political question and can be questioned. We haven't talked about that today, but the, the modes of campus operation in different countries can, can be interpreted in different uh, socio-political ways. And, and that's something, again, that uh, there's been a lot of thought and a lot of, of uh, research into, into how that works or how it doesn't work. Um, but coming back to the, the more linguistic aspects of it, it is in practice really, really difficult I mean, we, we ran a, a policy dialogue, a Franco-British policy dialogue on the future of employability with the British Council and with our partner, Haysam University in Paris recently. And we encouraged speakers to, to speak either in French or in English. And in the event, we had 80, 85% English, but a few presentations in, in French. And I think that was good. Uh, what, what we've also experimented now, 15 months ago, is having, having them bilingual so that uh, presenters switch backwards and forwards between French and English. The audience can manage or not manage. Uh, people manage to different, different um, uh, extents, but also there's a lot of whisper translation going on between people in the audience who sit next to each other. What was he saying? What were they saying? You know, there's, there, there are ways of adapting, but I think the, the, the important thing to do is to is to start thinking that through and start making it happen. It's, it's not a theoretical issue, it's a practical issue. How, how do we communicate with each other? How do we build this sort of pluralistic, um, plurilinguistic uh, environment, not only amongst our students, but amongst ourselves as well? Uh, so I think uh, there's, a, there's a, a lot to be done there. Thank you. 
Thank you, um, Tim. And thanks to all our speakers um, for what have been um, a terrific series of presentations um, that have talked about the vision of the university that lies behind the transnational campus, the vision in terms of our interactions, the projects uh, that we can follow through and fund. And uh, also, I mean, very interestingly, one of the things that we could have talked more about uh, that was mentioned was working with NGOs, for example, and the way in which that, that changes the nature of the uh, of the um, uh, of the degree programs that we can offer. Working with communities and above all, working uh, with uh, and expanding uh, our networks and include uh, and our networks of inclusive inclusivity and diversity. So, unfortunately, we have to stop there. But we can, of course, perhaps um, arrange similar events of this kind and touch base again in this uh, quite informal setting. But I'd like to conclude just by thanking very warmly our speakers. So a sort of a, a virtual round of applause and hope that we can resume this uh, conversation in which is absolutely vital in all shapes uh, and forms and for uh, going forward. So thank you again. And I look forward to seeing people soon again. Thank you.